Okay, so today's message is Life Light. Appreciate everybody joining us online too. We're going to start in Genesis 1, 1 and 3. I don't know how long we'll be on this one. You know, we've got a few to go through. This isn't a long message like usual, but there's a message in it. So I want to tell you what happened one day. And I can only share with you what the Holy Spirit reveals to me. I can only share with you what the Lord teaches me and what the Lord shows me, what the Lord reveals to me in truth. So it's been a few years ago now, and I was, you know, struggling through trying to get revelation. You ever get those little valleys in the Word, and you just kind of get stomped. So I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sit down and read the Bible through. I'm just going to start at the beginning and just go on through it. I sat down and read 1, 2, and 3 and got stuck. And I was there for months, literally months, and couldn't get off of it. And the Lord began to reveal to me, as He does from time to time, on what really happened. So we're going to make some corrections to some false teachings that I've heard out there. And I'm going to tell you what the Holy Spirit's revealed to me. You ain't got to believe it. That part's optional. <laughs> but you know, a man with a testimony is not a mercy of a man with argument. I know what the Holy Spirit has spoken to me. So Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. I'm going to go through this whole thing and we're going to come back to it, okay? And the earth was at form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered was hovering over the face of the waters and said, let there be light. And there was light. So we're going to talk about this later in the message, but in, God is light and there's no shadow of turning. He is ev His light is everywhere. In heaven, where God dwells, His presence illuminates heaven. There's no shadows anywhere. There's no light bulb. There's no sun. It is God. He lives in a spiritual realm. We operate in a kingdom not made with hands that we cannot see. That kingdom is in a spiritual realm. The Lord lives in a spiritual realm. Do you know that the physical realm didn't exist? God created the heavens and the earth. I do believe in the Big Bang Theory. God said, let there be. And it started happening. All right, so what happens is right now the creation, when God created the heavens and the earth, you have this vast expanse, this creation of the physical realm that we see today that overlaps into the spiritual realm. God does not dwell. His physical presence does not dwell in the spiritual realm. It was created and it was darkness. God's on the other side. He says, and the earth was without form and void. That word void in Hebrew literally means emptiness or utter chaos. It's darkness. He says it was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. God created waters over the earth. That word deep means waters. The waters covered the earth, and there was complete darkness, and it was in utter chaos. Now God said, let there be light, and light created in the physical realm. He created the sun to provide light. And I'm going to tell you something. Light demands order. Light commands order. If you got some chaos in your life, put some light on it. When the sun was plopped into space and God created light, all of a sudden, the earth rotates, the sun rotates around the earth. The earth rotates around the sun. It commanded order. Everything began to come into order. The earth that rotates and creates life from the sun, rotates around the sun. S order rotates around its light source. We as children of God have to rotate around the light source. We have chaos in our lives. It's because we took God out. We have chaos in our schools because we took God out. We have chaos in the government because we took God out. You want to fix the chaos? Turn the light on. It demands order. It says that light came out of the darkness. Darkness does not exist. Do you realize that? How about that? Darkness doesn't exist. It's simply the absence of light. Do you know that God didn't create evil? Evil is simply the absence of the presence of God. That's what becomes evil. God didn't create it. Just like darkness without the light. Darkness doesn't exist. It's the absence of light is what it is. You can't measure it. 
nor can you measure evil. It's pretty corrupt. But you tell you don't believe me? Take God out of your house and see how much chaos breaks out. We're dealing with division in our family now that's ungodly and uncalled for. It's not right because it's the absence of God. The Word of God is His will. The living, breathing Word of God is light. Jesus, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In 14 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Lord Jesus is light, and He brings and commands and demands order. When you put God into your life, He says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all things will be added to you. You seek the light source, and things change. Seek the kingdom of God. Get your eyes off of your problems. Get your eyes off of your relationships. Get your eyes off of your failures and your past. And seek God with a pure heart. And everything else will be added to you. We seek the light source because it's what gives us light and what gives us life in ourselves. The, the, the earth was without form and without void. I want to make a small correction. Maybe not everybody would know this. Some of the old Pentecostals from a different generation that were taught out of the Dake Bible, Finnis Dake said that God creates nothing in chaos. No, he doesn't. But he did not create chaos. Chaos existed in the absence of light. Finnis Dake said that there was a pre-Adamite society. In between Genesis 1, 2, and 1, 3, there was a people that lived here on this earth prior and then God created order. It's not biblical at all. There was nobody here prior to the creation of man. There was no pre-Adamite society. First of all, every word of prophecy is confirmed by two or more. If that were true, show me another verse that has anything to do with it at all. There's no other scripture. We don't preach speculation. We don't preach opinion. We preach absolute truth. The Lord said, I'm looking for a people that will worship me in spirit and in truth. We have to preach the word of God in the spirit of truth and the accuracy. We have a problem now with a lot of preachers that carry these varying opinions that aren't founded biblically. They were taught by somebody else that taught somebody else and they were all wrong. And because they have these big, beautiful ministries and they have millions of dollars a month coming in, oh, he must be right. I got news for you, he's wrong. People are preaching lies because they don't know any better. Preach out of the spirit of truth. Stop preaching lies and deceit. If you don't know, you don't know. But don't say you know and pretend like you know because we're going to be held accountable one day. God's going to hold us all accountable. It doesn't matter the size of the ministry. You don't measure a person by the size of their ministry. You measure the person by the condition of their heart. Period. You know, the condition of the heart is our measurement. And the Lord Jesus is our absolute This is from, we're going to, we don't spend a lot of time on this stuff, a word study in Hebrew. Hoshek. You got to say that, it sounds like Klingon. You got to say it with a little spit in the back of your throat. Hoshek is Hebrew for darkness. It literally means a lack of light in a space. There's a few, Hoshek means the same as darkness as it does terror, ignorance, sadness, confusion, and evil. It is just an absence of truth. It's an absence of light is all it is. Or is just like you roll your R's in Spanish. Or means light in Hebrew. And it is guidance, health, life, prosperity, enlightened judgment, and po other positive things. We need some light in our life. There's a lot of dark areas in our life. There's a lot of dark areas in our mind. And we need to shed some light on it. Do you know that when you flip the light switch on, our darkness and the light don't compete with each other? There's no argument. <laughs> when you turn the light on, it just comes on. What happens to the dark? It doesn't exist. It's absence of light. That's why it goes away. The light prevails always. But we have some dark spots in our life. We have some dark places in our marriages. We have some dark places in our relationships. And we haven't addressed these issues. And we didn't shed any light on it. And we suffer from it. We have some dark places in our finances. If your finances are a wreck, guess what? Get somebody to hold you accountable and put your budget together. Put some light on it. Expose it. It'll, it'll get better. It'll change. 
It's accountability. Anything measure, here's a little kingdom nugget for you. Anything that you can measure, anything that is measurable will naturally get better. If you don't believe me, get on the scale every day. It's a fact, I'm just telling you. Get on the scale every single morning and write it down. Don't do anything else. By nature, just by sheer nature, you'll begin to lose weight because you're aware of it. Anything measured will naturally improve on itself. If you want to get better in the Word, shed some light on it. Open it up. Read it. Get it inside of you. If you want to get better at things at work or at school, shed some light on it. It'll get better. If there's things in your marriage and your things that are going on in communication and they're dark places that we don't discuss, put some light on it. Hold some accountability. Okay, it's time to talk about this. We've, we've put it, we swept it under the rug and locked it in the closet like a stray cat and we hadn't talked about it in years. That thing's turned into a roaring lion. It grows and gets bigger. It's time for us to discuss it. It's time for us to deal with it. If you've got problems in your health, put some light on it. Do what you're supposed to do. Do you know we do all that we can do and we trust God for the rest? That's a revelation I've come to many times in my life and here I am again because yet I failed again. I got in the best shape of my life at 51, something like that. Somewhere around there. I'm 54 now, and I'm right back to where I was before. <laughs> I get, eat better, eat healthy, lose the weight, do all you can. It's like smoking cigarettes, and you got lung cancer. And you're going, God, heal me my lung cancer. <laughs> heal me, Lord. But do your part first. Put down the cigarettes. It's the alcoholic dying of liver disease. And going, Lord, heal me, but they still drink the drink every night. Do all you can do first. Put some light on it. And God brings healing. Life comes from outside, from inside of us out. Out of our bellies flow rivers of living water. It's not dark in there, it's light in there. If it's dark in there, you got a problem. Do you know as you're born into darkness? You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. It's just what it was. By one man's sin, sin was passed on to everyone. But Jesus came to fix it all. When you're born again, your spirit man goes from death to life. It goes from darkness to light, and the light shines inside of us. We talked about this a second ago. I'm going to go through it because there's two different translations I use here. One from the ESV and one from the New King James. ESV being... The Greek text and the New King James comes from the Latin text. But it says, every good and perfect gift comes, is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow due to change, which I believe is an accurate translation, at least to us, because we can understand it better. God cannot lie. He will never go back on His Word, and whatever He says is true. You can take it to the bank. He won't change. We're dealing with that right now. When God says no, his no is no, I promise you. It ain't like us to go, no, don't you do that. No, don't you do that. No, I told you, don't. why don't you listen to me? Because it doesn't mean anything. Your no means to me no the first time. Your yes is yes. I have a young man I'm dealing with now that's not here. And he keeps coming at me, and I said no. I said, son, I love you, but if I went back on my word, I wouldn't be a man of God, and you wouldn't respect me. No means no. Figure it out. Sometimes we got to stand our ground as men and women of God with some character, with some integrity. Do what you say you're, what you're going to do. Follow through and inspect what you did. Put some light on it. We need to be people of character, people of spirit. He says, I'm looking for a people that worship me in spirit and in truth. Do you know you have to walk in the spirit to walk in truth? You can't walk in the flesh. There's nothing good in the flesh but lies and death. It will deceive you. And give it enough time, it will fail you. Take a person that's been delivered and lock them up in a closet with all their vices and see how long it takes them to fall. Minutes. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. That's the translation I grew up on, no variation or shadow of turning. That turning literally means change. God never changes there will never be a shadow. There will never be a lie. The word of prophecy is always real. And if he says it, you can count on it. 
is over. What did we come up with last time? 300 verses, 300 prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ. He fulfilled them all. Eight of them is astronomical. 48 of them is a number beyond anything that's of human knowledge right now. It is literally a mathematical impossibility that the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled the prophecies that he fulfilled if he wasn't God. That's because he is. He was, he is, and he always will be. John 1, 1, 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light in whom there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Man, that's a toughie there, dude. That's a toughie there. I love you. But you say you're a Christian? Love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Do for other people. Give. Be men and women of God and love one another. He says, if you don't, you're living a lie. There is a difference between a Christian that's on fire for God, that's awake, that's experienced the awakening, and they're in the Word. There's a difference in a Christian who ain't got none of that. They're a Christian, but they're in the world. They're called carnal Christians. It's glory to glory, though. We learn and we grow and we come out of that. I was a carnal Christian for years and still am from time to time, depending on how mad I get. But you do grow out of that and you learn and you develop. We have to come out of that carnal Christianity and come to a selfless, a selfless life that we live for Christ outside of our own will, that we live for God's will. But if we walk in the light and He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ, the blood of Jesus, His Son cleanses us from all sin. If you walk in the light, you walk in fellowship with one another. This is how you'll know. This is how they will know you're my disciples, is that you love one another. That's how the world knows that we're Christians. They see the love for each other. They see the love during the storm. They would come together. Tragedy brings unity. They would come together in the face of storms. This is how the world knows that we're Christians, is that we love one another and that we're family. And then you get one of your kids goes, Dad, there's something weird about your church. I said, what is it? It's like everybody loves each other. It's like family or something. Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Right? Isn't that the whole point? That it's not just about me. I hold an office out of the fivefold to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Do you know that the ministry is your responsibility, not mine? I'm just to prepare you so you can go out there and do it. So go do your job. <laughs> go witness Christ resurrected in the earth. Come back to church with a testimony and tell me you got a chance to lead somebody to the Lord. Tell me you laid hands on the sick and they recovered. Tell me that you were able to cast out demons and devils. Somebody got delivered from heroin, nicotine, alcohol. You saw somebody's life change. Get to the man. This isn't a sexist statement. Get to the man, you get to the whole household. Fact. If a house is walking in order like it should, some are out of order. Get to the man. It brings it in order. He'll bring, it may take a while, but it'll bring it in order. Light demands and commands order. It's just the way it works. It's nature. That's the way God intended it. The sun doesn't revolve around the earth. The sun does not revolve around you. The earth doesn't revolve around you. We revolve around the light, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. John 9, 4 through 5. We must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day, but night is coming when no one can work. This was when Jesus was here, was the light of the world. I'm going to make a point with this. But He said, the night is coming. That was when He died, before the resurrection. It is darkness without Christ in the earth. He says, while I am here, I am the light of the world, as long as I'm in the world. But guess what? Jesus ain't here. He rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. But he said, it's better for you that I go, that I might send the comforter. He gets to heaven and sends his Holy Spirit back. And on the day of Pentecost, the church was born. And guess what? Light entered you. Light entered you. And now you are the children of light. We are the light of the world. How is the world going to see the gospel if our light is not bright enough to shine? If we don't let it out and we don't tell somebody, if we go hide in the closet, hide in our basement, 
hide in our homes, hide at church, hide at work, and we don't tell anybody about Christ, how will they know? We are the light of the world. We are the ones I saw. The multitudes, these light shafts, that people see that. They know something's different. They know something's different. When you go to work, something's changed, and you got a smile on your face. They're like, hey, bro, uh, why are you smiling? <laughs> what's, what's going on with you? Why are you so happy? Something's changed. So you look a little different. When people, I, I had this, I'll testify real quick. This is quite lengthy. Are y'all hungry yet? <laughs> can, I, can I testify for just a second? Okay, so this was a long testimony. I'm going to break it up into halvesies. <laughs> well, the other one's actually even more powerful. But this was a light in a darkness. We got one, we lost one. But he didn't lose any that are not his own. So I had a dealership, and the kids know. They've heard this story many, 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 many times. Right? I testify all the time. It's not bragging, but we got to testify the goodness of God. And I say this for a reason, because we just talked about the countenance of a face changing. It's the most dramatic salvation I've ever seen. So I had a man come to my dealership. We had, a, we had our own store. or We had our own dealership about 20-something years ago in Lawrenceville. And I had more people get born again in that dealership and we sold cars that one December. We had revival break out in the store. I used to preach and walk around and sing and shout in tongues and pray all day long in that place. I had a blast. So I sold a car to this couple. They had moved down from Michigan um, with five kids. And, you know, it was just typical worldly folks. You know, he was a gambler, and they were meth heads and struggling with drugs and addiction, covered from head to toe in tattoos. It's, it's not bad. Tattoos are not, I'm not saying tattoos are a bad thing. It's not about tattoos. But when, they, when you got spider webs that grow up around your neck and you got a black widow in your forehead, well, just, you know, be selective, <laughs> right? Use your brain. So anyway, or just don't do it at all. It's okay if you got them, but I prefer you didn't do it again. How about that? Right? <laughs> We're made in the image of God. Keep them where they're at, and it's good. Let's put the brakes on for just a little while. Just a little while. I know, I know. Okay, good. Okay, so this guy comes in, and I witnessed to him. I, I can't remember his name. We'll call him Johnny. Was it Johnny? You remember? I think it was Johnny. We'll call him Johnny for now, which is fine. So... He was a mover and a shaker, and he's popping and hopping all the time. He's always geeked out when he comes into the store. He came in the store, so I tried to witness to him. And I invited him to church. He said, "Oh no, I'm not going to church." He said, "I'll come listen to you, but I ain't going to church." I said, "All right." So every time he came in, I witnessed to him, and I said, "Johnny, the Lord's calling you to repentance. It's time to get born again. It's time to receive Christ." He goes, "Oh man, I can't do it. I can't do it, Charles. I can't do it." You sure? <laughs> yeah, I can't do it. Said, okay, all right. So one day, the kids were with me in the car that day. I had taken them to, we had this old van, the door creaked on it, and it was pitiful. I put Angie in some rough vehicles through the years. But we, we, were at the, we were at the McDonald's in front of the Mall of Georgia, and we lived in Swanee. And we had gone to, I'd shut the dealership down, and we went to Christmas shopping. So I think it was the last time I was at the mall. We use Amazon every year now because I'm too lazy. I don't like going out in public. So we were at the drive-thru, and Johnny calls me, and he's mad. He says, I got to pay my car payment. I said, I'm not there today. He said, I got to pay it now. He knew he was going to either shoot it up or do whatever he does with it. It was going to be gone. He says, I got to pay you now. I got the money because he had been behind his friend. was going to repossess his car. They were always late and never did pay you. I don't think they paid it a couple times. So I said, forget it, dude. I'm not there. I got mad at him, and I was pretty hard with him. He said, well, I don't know where I'm at anyway. I'm lost. <laughs> he, said, he said, I'm in my truck. I'm at the bank, and I don't know where I'm at. They keep, he's from Michigan. He literally did not know where he was. So we leave the mall of Georgia from that phone call, drive 985 south to 85 Junction, get off at the first exit, which is Lawrence Swanee Road, and hang a left. That's about eight miles, give or take, in another city. My dealership's downtown Lawrenceville, a long ways away from there. I take a left, and we're driving home because we're off of that road. 
and there's a Bank of America right there. And we're driving along, and I look over, and I see the truck. I see a truck. I don't know what he drives. It's still something he had for work, I guess. And the Lord said, that's him Turn around. I mean, <laughs> just like that. I whipped that thing around, and she says, what are you doing? I said, I'll tell you in a minute. Fact. You remember? I turned the, turned the van around. I went back. I parked. I walked into the bank. I opened the door, and there was Johnny standing at the counter. I said, Johnny. And man, he turned around, <laughs> looked like an eye. Woo! He's like, what in the world? He thought like he'd seen a ghost. I said, when you get done, step out here. I want to talk to you. He says, yes, sir. I'll be right there. Uh, so I waited outside the bank, and Johnny came out. And I said, son, I said, God's calling you. It's time. The Lord's calling you to repentance. He sent me here to tell you he knows right where you're at all the time. It's time. I said, you're ready to accept Christ. He dropped his head. He said, I can't do it. Like, what? what? If I showed up and popped up for you in the middle of nowhere and said, hey, God sent me here to you. <laughs> what? To me, I would I'd immediately, yes, yes, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uncle, uncle, I, I want to go to heaven. He said, no. Okay. A couple of weeks had gone by. And then his wife came in on a Saturday. And she was nervous and shaking. You know, as a young lady that was scared, lonely, broke, hurting, fearful for her kids. And she was crying. And I, I had witnessed to her immediately about a man who had survived, he survived a suicide attempt. That's the other part of the story. I'll tell you all later one day. So I witnessed to her about that, how he survived. I felt compelled to witness to her. And she began crying uncontrolled. It was the most unbelievable thing. I mean, snot, tears, ugly crying, so bad I was afraid to hug her. It was bad. She's screaming and shaking. I said, lady, I said, you got to calm down so you can tell me what's going on. And she finally got her composure. She says, Charles... They didn't call me Charlie back <laughs> She said, Charles, I was going to kill myself today, and I pulled off on the side of the road, and I prayed for God to send me to somebody. I said, well, you know what? Today's your day. Are you ready to accept Christ as your Savior? And she said, yes. And I said, great. I said, and I led her in the sinner's prayer. She got born again in that ugly, snotty, nasty, crying face. She, I mean, lit up like a Christmas tree. The countenance of her face changed instantly. She went from death to life and was born again. Light entered her spirit, and it was incredible. It was the most beautiful salvation that I've ever seen. Well, until recently, Angie and I both were a witness to another one that was probably equal to as powerful. It was, it was an incredible event. But that lady changed. Well, Sunday goes by, Monday morning comes, and I get a phone call. And it's Johnny. He's on the phone. What the hell did you do? That was the opening statement. I was like, oh, I knew he was mad. I knew he was real mad. I said, I said, bro, I just, I witnessed Christ resurrected. And it wasn't his wife, by the way. The Lord told me that. And I told her there and she admitted it. I said, I, I forget her name, Amy, whatever. I said, I witnessed Christ resurrected to Amy. She got born again. He says, well, she left me, took her five kids, and went home to her husband in Michigan. <laughs> she repented. And guess what? Her husband in Michigan that she went home to was a preacher. Oh. That man, this was uh, a week later. I came into the dealership one day, and my car was there. That man, he, overnight, he drove all the way from Michigan to bring me my car back and drove back and left me a message and thanked me. So Johnny, our conversation went south fast. And I knew he was talking suicidal talks, language. And I said, Johnny, can I pray for you? And he says, you better, because ain't nobody ever going to hear from me again. I knew it was serious. And I prayed, and I bound, and I cursed, and I blessed, and I tied, and I loosed, and I, I, did, every, I, I did everything I could think of. Every word of God that I knew in me to preach and pray for him at that moment I did and that man hung up the phone and went in the garage and hung himself mm -hmm. now I was sitting at my desk 
And we talk about light and darkness, darkness simply being the absence of light was one of the visions I've seen into the darkness and seen into hell. The other one was at my grandmother's house of all places. Absence of God is darkness. I was sitting there and this vision opened up. I mean, right in front. Black like you don't know black. Dark like there is no other dark. It's unbelievable. It's so dark. It's thick and consuming. The darkness, the emptiness of space was beyond description. It was horrifying. The tortures of hell is the awareness of your absence from God, and you can't fix it again. It's over. And I saw Johnny screaming, and he's fall. This is what's weird, right? There is no light. It is a place you don't see, but you're aware of it, so you know it's burning. You know where you're at. You know where everybody else is at, too. And you know what's coming, and you know you can't fix it, but you can't see anything. He's screaming I, like nothing. I mean, it's, it was worse than when Laverne fell in the basement. That was horrible. That was Trump. That was, we got PTSD from that when she broke her hip. This was worse than that like 10 times. Screaming with agony I've never known. And that darkness hit me. It was, it was all I could do to get through it. I've seen light. And I've seen darkness. Trust me, church. Choose life. Choose light. It's important because once you take your last breath, there's no fixing it. God has not lost any one of His. Those that are going to make it will make it. Those that are chosen will come to Him. They will make it. He hasn't lost anyone. Those that don't make it, we're never going to make it. It ain't like God failed and we lost a few. He gave everybody an opportunity and everybody's going to have an opportunity. And those come to Christ, come to Christ. Accept Him and share the light. Be a voice in this community. Be a voice in this generation. Be a light in a dark place because those people that you witness to may never hear it otherwise. They may, may never see the light in anyone else. For those of you that have spouses that are living in a dark place, do you know that I have a right to speak into your life because you come here. I can share with you. I can correct you. I can chastise you when you do stuff wrong, right? Because you come here. You submit to me. As a spouse, you have a right to speak into that spouse's life because you're married. I can't go to them and go, hey, man, you got to get it together. It's not my place. You might be the only person that they could ever hear or would ever listen to. It's your responsibility. We just got two more, and we're going to call it, and we'll eat, and we'll pray for dinner. So bear with me. Ephesians 5 and 8. For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. We talked about holiness and righteousness, sanctification. Act like Christians. Be grateful and walk in the light. Walk in the gospel of God and share your faith at work and at church and at home and at schools. Be children of light in this world. And I promise you this is miraculous. I have witnessed to a brother. He's not here today. He's tired. Kelby's wore out and exhausted. And I said, I'm telling you, let's just pray and trust me. When it happens, you can't force it on someone. But when God creates these dynamic encounters, it just happens. And it's beautiful. It's incredible. You get to witness the people at the grocery store and at Kroger at the Quick Trip and whoever, wherever. Just stumble into people and you, so all of a sudden somebody gets born. Their life's changed instantly and you didn't do anything but be there. And I said, Kelby, let's pray. And I said, we're just going to trust God for some kingdom connections from some dynamic moments. And we prayed. It was the next day he called me. He ain't going to believe it. I said, yeah, I will. <laughs> he met somebody. Boom. All he did was share his light. He turned the light bulb on. They saw it. You ready to accept Christ? Yes. They get born again. You need to lead someone to the Lord. But all you got to do is tell them about Jesus. It's not hard. Guess what? It ain't you. It's the Lord Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that pulls a person to conviction. It's not up to you to convince, persuade, to wrestle with, to sell, to build these three dynamic points and come to a conclusion that's climatic, climactic end. And then you go for the punchline. No. You just witness Christ resurrected. You're ready to receive the Lord. And they go, yes. And they're like, wow, that was easy. That's the way it works. 
We've talked about children of light. And then this is, I'm going to go back to the last one. This is the last one we'll cover and then we'll close for the day. 2 Peter 1, 16 through 19. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Peter's telling you that we didn't, this is not a fairy tale or a fable or some made up story. Peter's saying, listen to me. I saw what I'm telling you. I was a witness to this, which is powerful. That means his testimony should be powerful enough as being a witness to this. For when we received honor and glory from the God, from God the Father, and the voice of, was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This was the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter saw with his own eyes and heard with his own ears when he saw Jesus transformed and Moses and Elijah were there with him and he hears the voice of God. He says, I was a witness to that. I heard it. That all will be enough. But he says, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain and we have a prophetic word more fully confirmed. The word of God is full of prophecy. He said, your Bible that you read every single day the word of prophecy that speaks to our lives, that speaks to our future, to our children, the word of prophecy that is alive and well, that prophesied the Lord Jesus Christ into existence and is prophesying His coming. The word of God is more powerful than me witnessing Jesus, Moses, and Elijah on the mountain and hearing the voice of God. The word of prophecy is more, more powerful than my witness. That's what Peter's telling you. You want to get light in your life? Read the Word. You don't need another prophecy. You may get one. Guess what? There's all the prophecy you'll ever need. That's all the Word of God you'll ever need is in that Bible. You want to hear from God? Read the Word. Get it in you, and it'll come alive in you. He says, For we have the prophetic Word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention. That's in yellow for a reason. That's high. You will do well to pay attention. Just trust me. If somebody's preaching the word or you're reading the word for yourself, take a minute to slow down and pay attention. Read it. Meditate on it. Let it get deep in your heart and deep in your soul. It will change your life. It brings change. It renews the mind, those neurons that are polluted with sinful thoughts, smells of these places. that You know, you never forget a smell. You might forget my name one day. You'll never forget a smell, ever. Everything you've ever smelled, you'll never forget. It's all in there. And when you smell it, these memories pop back. So we have these sinful occasions that are interlocked and interwoven with all of our senses. These colors, these places, these times of day and seasons and temperatures and weather. And it reminds us of sin. It's all in our head and our foundations are still corrupt. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the watering of the word. And pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Until the Lord comes back. He says, pay attention. Pay attention to my word and apply it to your life. Pay attention until I return because I'm coming for you. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. It was 6,000 years prior to the Lord Jesus Christ that the world does not acknowledge, yet... Time changed. It's 2024. It's been 2,024 <laughs> years since the Lord Jesus was here. He changed time. The world doesn't acknowledge it, but we changed our calendars for it. It was 6,000 years prior. It's been 2,000 years since. And he says the millennial reign of Christ is coming. It's that last 1,000 years that we will rule and reign with him. He is coming, and he said, encourage each other with these things. We're going to close in the Lord's Prayer and then we'll have a time of private prayer to meet any needs. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.